Hey, in this episode of Hot Hardware's Two and a Half Geeks, Coffee Lake's Ara Flowin will be traversing Hades Canyon. We'll have ThinkPads in HDR, seriously supercomputers and details of our awesome AMD gaming rig giveaway next. Welcome back to another episode of the show we affectionately call Hot Hardware's Two and a Half Geeks. 2.5 geeks if you want to do it short and uh because shorthand's important sometimes you must be efficient i'm dave altavilla thanks for joining us and uh with me as always marco Chipetta uh, and and chris this time we sometimes have paul we sometimes have chris chris getting also a uh a geek from the hot hardware team gentlemen happy wednesday it's it is the official uh hump day 5 30 hour chris is drinking scotch what's the vibe like in maine buddy uh, is it whiskey? It's cold and rainy right now. It's scotch, whiskey, uh, whatever you want to call it. But yes, this is this is Some... Scottish, so it would be scotch. Ah, hey, if it's not made in Scotland, it's crap. Um, no, that's good. It's good. You know, you got to lubricate. It's important. And in we were just talking about this. We should probably have cocktail hour because it is five thirty. You know. Um, some folks on the East Coast now have at least uh, punched their time cards and uh, are now kicking into wind down mode. So that's important. Marco, are you uh, are you winding down the day in Connecticut? I, I I am sort of winding down the day. I don't have scotch. I have water in a plastic cup. Not as exciting, <laughs> but I, I have a, I have a nephew coming over to a nephew coming over to fix a PC right after this, and I'll have Fixing a nice your PC? And No, I, but one of his PCs. Um, need somewhere we just built a new pc and it's not working out so we're going to swap some parts and see what happens nice excellent so and when's he coming over as soon as this is over i told him be here after 6 30. <laughs> i am i am tweeting and and messaging folks to say come join us uh hit that subscribe button so you can get notified and uh if you have questions fire them off in the chat and uh yeah we'll uh we'll, we'll be efficient here move along so that Marco can get to the geekdom that he does so well with uh, computers and stuff. <laughs> For all the family and friends, are you like the family technician? You can't get away from it. If uh, something breaks, it's your fault and you must be called. Aren't, aren't we all? <laughs> yeah. Took the totally words right out of my mouth. That. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you're uh, you're you're a net admin dude or a, a sys admin. You can't get away from it ever, even in the day job. Well, not, so. not just here. I also cover for my dad's business out in California remotely. So it uh, yeah. it keeps me busy. Never a dull moment. Never a dull moment here in tech. And lots going on this week. Um, I was actually out in uh, sunny san jose do you know the way to san jose apparently the plane did it got me out there and i met with the folks at nvidia we'll be talking about some stuff from from them supercomputers powered by uh their stuff um no shortage of things to report on and stuff to test marco and i are feverishly grinding away on new hardware uh which we'll get to some of during the podcast here but um probably the most prominent headline this week Intel unleashes a salvo of Coffee Lake 8th Gen Core laptop and desktop chips, Core i9 mobile CPUs, and uh, 300 series chipsets for the platform for the desktop side. The Core i9 mobile is the first six core in a laptop form factor. Marco, impressive stuff from the folks at Intel. Chipzilla, affectionately known as Chipzilla, huh? So, so much stuff, but not just those chips. Um, it was sort of a low-key announcement you know we had a quick little briefing and the, the the release went out but there was a ton of stuff that intel announced so we have the core i9 six core mobile chip that dave just mentioned um we also have um a new performance mode in that chip it's called intel thermal velocity boost so which basically as long as there's thermal headroom in that chip um it'll boost higher longer for even more performance new 300 series chipsets um four different chipsets with enhanced io and updated audio um, they also have usb 3.1 gen 2 support built in new optane memory solutions for laptops not just on the desktops Optane can now also accelerate a secondary drive, which is a cool new feature. So if you have a huge, fast NVMe SSD for your OS already, 
but a big hard drive, say for your Steam library, you can throw an Optane drive in and accelerate your hard drive without affecting your OS drive. So lots of crazy stuff. Um, and they also have a new line of mobile chips with Iris Plus graphics. Now, if you remember back to Broadwell, specifically on the desktop, there were there were mobile chips too, but on the desktop, there was the Core i7-5775, which had eDRAM cache on the die. So the, the graphics had access to a fast eDRAM cache. That's back in these new mobile chips um, with Iris Plus graphics. So a whole bunch of stuff going on here. Wow. Yeah, geez, I guess. What's most prominent <laughs> for you? I mean, holy mackerel, let's uh let's pick a pick a target and, and shoot at it. Um for me, I think what was impressive was the the new SKUs that are available for notebooks. And uh, there was some lower power stuff for desktops, as, as you noted, um, and certainly all that Optane goodness for um, super fast, uh, low latency IO throughput. Um, man, that was deep. Um, but but bigger, faster processors that also, you know, chill out and sip power when they need to and then kick into high gear when you need them to crunch. Right. What, what was what was your favorite flavor of Intel announcement, I guess? So the, the two things that I think are, are super interesting, like if you just step back for a second, Intel now has super fast, high speed, true six core processors for mobile. You know, the, the I can't read the, the slide clearly. Core i9 8950K, I think it's the 8950HK. Yeah. They also have some Xeon branded mobile parts that are six cores, 12 thread, and only 45 watt uh, thermal design power. In, in a notebook, I mean, that's a ton of performance. That's more performance than last year's high-end mainstream desktop. So, you know, uh, yeah, it's crazy. So that's pretty awesome. I'm also really intrigued by these new chips with the, the Iris Pro graphics. So that eDRAM cache, it, it it's accelerates graphics, but it could be used for other stuff as well. Anybody that saw the performance of uh, the 5775 a couple of years ago, saw how well it did with certain workloads and how snappy of a chip it was for you know everyday computing. That should be pretty great in these notebooks. Um, I'm looking forward to testing one of those out. You know, definitely, definitely looking forward to checking yeah. that stuff out. Now on the desktop, as Dave mentioned, I, I kind of glossed over. I didn't really burn through the SKUs, but there's new eighth gen core. Uh, desktop processors as well that are lower power. So if you're looking to build a nice, quiet, low power, but still plenty fast, you know, you have a, you know, there's six core parts in here too. Um, what's the wattage? A 35 watt six core desktop processor. That's crazy. Uh, Core i7 yeah. 8700T. So just so much new stuff that Intel just kind of threw it at us and said, hey, look at all the stuff we got coming. <laughs> What what what, do you, what is your take on this? I mean, Intel is absolutely firing on all cylinders. Um, they've got some pretty aggressive uh, market strategies, go to market strategies, and other areas where um, you know you would say are non traditional for Intel areas of like you know that that are new and burgeoning for the market, like IoT, like uh, you know drones, like AI and machine learning with their Nirvana stuff, but. They're still what, what I think it, this feels like to me. It, it still is like they're 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 firing and, and executing on the CPU side harder than ever. And I think that's maybe a little bit of a hat tip and a thank you to the folks at AMD that are giving them chase, right? I, I think a, a, some of it is that. I also think some of it is Intel realizing getting into all these other different low margin markets may not have been a great idea and now they're refocused on core competency let's make the mm. pc and the chips inside the pc awesome and that'll permeate outwards instead of trying to stick their fingers in everything and all this little stuff that's out there um we also have some upcom upcoming parts from amd so this is also them making some noise before that happens now some of mm. these low power desktop parts are interesting because you might have we haven't tested it, so I'm completely speculating. But let's say the 8700T, 35 watt, six core processor. Um, let's say that competes with the Ryzen, the second gen Ryzen. Uh, what is it? That I forget the model number. I might, I might not even be allowed to say it, so I'm not going to say it. But the six core <laughs> Ryzen, Ryzen processor. Let's say it competes with that at half the power. That's a compelling story, also. 
So it's just lots of lots of stuff out here to uh, to digest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. I think um, I think it, it's impressive what Intel's been bringing to the market lately. Um, one of the things we should note that wasn't quite frankly because um, I talked to the Intel team before launch and um, uh, you know about this under NDA as you did, but, but we expected them to be a little bit more prominent about this because frankly it's sort of the 800 pound gorilla or the, the elephant in the room. That's maybe the better euphemism, the elephant in the room. <laughs> if you get my, my uh, zoo animals right, um, is, is the fact that the performance claims they've made for, like, for example, in the notebook space, where now we've got quad cores and six cores, um, and, and the gains that are associated with those new chips are post patch, are post meltdown and spectra, right? So, Folks are thinking, yeah, Intel's throwing all this great stuff at the market, but what's the real performance numbers? Um, let's make sure we underscore that, I guess. Um, it, all of these are, are the numbers of the performance that we we will show in the, in the weeks ahead are, are post-patch, right? Uh, yes. So all the stuff Intel from this, from the last few weeks forward, all of the, all of the performance numbers Intel is quoting are, are post-patch. Um, yeah. And in that converse, in the conversations that we had with Intel, something that I brought up that we've mentioned on the podcast before, it's very likely moving forward as other mitigation strategies are implemented that the performance impact that has been shown might be lessened going forward. But right now, the the numbers are the numbers, and they they're still they're still strong. You know, it's um yeah you know they just had to they had to adjust they had to pivot they had to fix some stuff, but these are still super fast processors, so it is what it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Chris, are you jonesing for a six core laptop, or is that not your kind of jam? Well, I like the super efficient ultrabook side of the notebook game, but uh, we whenever we can add more cores and more performance on the desktop side, that's where I really like to see the power. Yeah, yeah. I think I think it's impressive what what we're getting into. Um, you know, four four and five pound notebook footprints. You know, certainly, you know, you're not going to see these, and you'll you'll see quad cores in in two and a half to three pound ultrabooks, uh, thin and lights, mm -hmm. ultra lights. Um, but <clears throat> when you talk about the average fifteen inch machine now, that's not a huge boat anchor laptop like a gaming notebook being able to support. Uh, one of the machines that came out, actually, which is sounding fantastic, is the XPS 15 from Dell was announced. And that's going to have that six core, core i9 variant in, in an available SKU, along with a GeForce GTX 1050 Ti discrete graphics upgrade from the 1050 that's currently in it. So a little bit of a kick on the, the, uh, the GPU side and then two more cores on the CPU side. When you think about a notebook like the XPS 15, a beautiful 15 inch machine that's not all that it's not that big it's more like in a four, 14 inch footprint being able to mm -hmm. support a six core processor that's that's kind of cool <laughs> it's awesome. yeah yeah <laughs> well you 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 rock an xps 13 right chris yeah. yeah but i'm still back on broadwell so i'm definitely due for improvements there you just need to do some more reviews you'll get some notebooks in uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't. Well, actually, we have to send them back. Unfortunately, that's what most people don't understand. Is that? But it's ugh. like pre-shopping. You get a you get a it, test it drive is. it, and then when that's you do it. purchase, you get a nice idea of what you're looking for, which we try to translate that's to it. in our articles. Yeah, exactly. That's that is the, the ultimate goal. Is in addition to uh, you know evaluating this product and giving a recommendation for it. Hopefully, you're coming to places like Hot Hardware for a buying decision and we help you make that intelligently based on your specific usage model which everybody's mm -hmm. a little different everybody's a little different different strokes for different folks all right let's um let's talk about something else that's way different than this hold um, on but also but hold on hold oh, on all right. quick super fast super <laughs> fast yeah uh, yeah yeah i mentioned the new chipsets i have a sneak peek of a gigabyte motherboard posted oh i um, forgot that during the, the h370 n that still working through a couple of configuration things. Um, I should have a full review up as soon as I work through that. But four new chipsets uh, came down the pipeline. Um, the H370 is the high-end one. There's the H310, the Q370, and the B360. Um, 
The B360 is a you know a consumer slash corporate Q370 is a corporate chipset. It has you know uh, the trusted platform stuff sort of built in. But uh, come by the site, check out the preview. I have the breakdown of the chipsets there and some really nice pictures of the motherboard and the BIOS. Full review is coming soon. Cool. Thank you for for prompting <laughs> that. I've I've failed. Fired. I'm fired. Trump me or something because I didn't do my job there. I'll, I'll do yeah, the Cobra. No, You're fired. You're fired. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i should only be so lucky yeah dang it uh, <laughs> well no that's that's good stuff uh yeah we will we will have a forthcoming uh coverage of of all of these things intel in the in the weeks ahead so make sure you swing on by um and uh we will uh we will have that that coverage up marco is like i said uh losing sleep at a blinding pace with all this hardware into test. All right. So, yeah, let's talk about m m things with respect to processing at a higher level. NVIDIA unveils Beastly 2 Petaflop DGX2 AI supercomputer with 32 gigabyte Tesla V100s and a new NV switch technology. John, I don't know if you can get that beast up on the screen, but it is uh, impressive to see incarnate. Um, that's the that's the CPU. If you scroll down the bottom there, John, we will see the um, I think down the bottom we've got pictures of the actual rack. Yeah, there it is right there. That is an absolute um, beast of a machine. That is the DGX2 NVIDIA AI supercomputer is a follow on to the DGX1. And uh, Chris, um, we we know a little bit about this machine. It's got a couple of new parts. One's an amped up GPU. We've also got a, a switch technology here that I think is more the special sauce than anything else, right? Yeah, so um, the new hardware here, uh, they've bumped it up as well to 32 gigs of HBM2 memory right on board. So super fast access for all the data it needs to crunch um, right there. Uh, so it's an improvement. The previous generation Tesla was just 16 gigs, which is a healthy amount, but you know, the researchers and data scientists and everyone working on these is really screaming for more memory and faster memory. Um, that's before we even get to the cores and everything else inside the GPU itself. Um, so as far as the DGX2 goes, um, it's employing, let's see, what is it? The dual 28 core Xeon processors um, and up to 16 GPUs inside of that. Uh, so the processing power you can get from one of these units is just, I don't really even know how to comprehend it. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's pretty nuts. Yeah, no, and, and that's the thing. It's, um, it is, it's something that is way outside the realm for most folks. But if you're a technologist and an enthusiast, like, like we all are, uh, with, with, uh, with the product and with the hardware that's out in the market, um, this kind of stuff is interesting. This is a this is a machine learning supercomputer that Nvidia has put together to seed developers on its platform and to enable um, you know the cloud with uh, additional CPU uh, and GPU not CPU mostly GPU excuse me uh, compute resources for machine learning and AI and the 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 hook with this machine as as you noted Chris is that yeah you've got these thirty two gig um, memory pools now on each GPU, 32, 32 gigs of memory versus 16, doubling that. But now you've also doubled the number of GPUs inside the cabinet and mm -hmm. uh, inside this this big rack. And they've done this with a unique way. It, it, it's a it's a technology called NV Switch, which is a follow on to NV Link um, from NVIDIA, which is their their previous switch technology that um, serial link technology that links up to it used to link up to eight of these uh, Tesla V100 Volta based GPUs is a Volta GPU architecture. Now it can link twice that amount, 16. And the the reason it's unique is because it's a serial switch topology that now you all GPUs can talk to each other and share and share each other's memory so it's one big contiguous memory space and brain really and network it's fast. Yeah. Yeah, I'm saying it's so, uh, f five times faster than the fastest PCI Express switch. Yeah, the chip itself. Yeah, okay. So yeah, that that's 
Exactly. I think I was talking to the guys at Intel, and and um, we actually had a, an impromptu meeting uh, while I was out there, and that's what they're working on, like on, on the Nirvana side. You know, they're working on their core technology as well. But the one of the architects I was talking to was saying that's kind of the name of the game. System architecture is huge. It's not just you know build that big gorilla gpu you know you know processing brain whatever the technology is at the processor level the whole the whole mm -hmm. racks got to support scale and uh so it, it's like you know these these companies that are you know like nvidia and intel are are actually beginning to to realize that now that you know you should, yeah. if you have a, a big fast engine you, you need big highways to run it on <laughs> right and so. the more you can scale the more you can break it up across different uh virtualization systems uh the more you can leverage every little bit of it because you get different projects going at once as well um, and really eke out every little bit of performance from that system you can to maximize your dollar return in in your yeah. research or processing whatever you're trying to do with it yeah yeah, it's it's cool to see this stuff. I think what most most folks, um, you know, when when you look at this machine, even if you're an enthusiast, it's like, okay, what's the application? Um, but really, um, it, it runs the gamut. I, I think one of the demos they did on stage was um, it was actually uh, machine learning on the GPU versus machine machine learning on on the CPU, and they did this what they call inference processing example, where they they took multiple they had this this series of uh, thousands of pictures of flowers you know and different genus and species types of of, of flowers and um you know i'm not going to go back to my horticulture roots because i have none and hey, there's a pun roots horticulture get it um <laughs> and and yeah the, it, you could see that the the cpu was recognizing them there's an iris there's an orchid there's a daisy you know at a certain pace and then they flipped on the gpu and it was like you know a yeah, hundred across eight rows deep and the thing is just panning through them like nothing and getting you know recognizing the image interpreting what it was in, in inferring what it what it is uh at a at a much faster rate because they do that parallel processing thing so well yeah unbelievable Which cool stuff is actually a workload that i have looked for on my phone before trying to take a picture of a plant to see if i can identify what it is but couldn't find anything at the time but maybe we're close really big, big really? does it yeah. now in, in the galaxy big, s9 does it what back well, we, we were taking pictures of food and it was telling us the food and the calorie counts it was pretty cool <laughs> it was telling you calorie counts too i didn't see that oh. yeah well i mean it, it had the data there for that sure huh interesting yeah i, I wonder I, if I it's going that. yeah going off a Go database ahead. or is it judging portion size through a scale or some way no i mean it was just a rough estimate so like um they had food out on on the on a bar and if you pointed bixby at the foods it would tell you what the food is and then give you you know the nutritional information if you wanted it nice Fair enough. yeah i remember that i remember that and i was i was kind of like it didn't really sink in at the time but that's kind of impressive that I, I didn't realize it was given the nutritional information but yeah that's in a in a smartphone which is yeah. so that's something wild. you can you can build your own app out get uh get a cloud account with one of these nvidia setups to power all your image recognition or whatever you're looking for and uh make yourself some money <laughs> there you go there you go Oh, that's uh, so it's it's impressive stuff to see. And the folks at NVIDIA are really, you know, they're sort of mopping up in the market with this thing. Um, they're clearly a leader in in uh, the machine learning space with their GPU architecture. They did it way back when by um, enabling developers and even college students, you know, researchers at the college level um, with this thing called CUDA, which was their API for for um, GPU compute for computing on the GPU. And um they seeded the market with that thing so well that you know, they're sort of the de facto now in machine learning on the gpu which is a big chunk of the current market but mm -hmm. um yeah it'd be interesting to watch how how this thing pans out because there's a lot of players coming into play now you got you got uh, google with uh tensor cores and the tensor processor you've got uh microsoft with its work with fpgas um uh you know the skynet's coming right marco you're not afraid of skynet right 
<laughs> oh, I am. We're 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 dead meat. I'm totally afraid of Skynet. <laughs> <laughs> then again, it's gotta be doing me a favor, taking me off of this friggin' blue marble. <laughs> well, that's before we get yeah. to all the quantum computer developments that have been coming out. Or up yeah, to what, exactly. Fifty something qubits and probably more. It's been a while since I've looked. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Was, what? Are, yeah, I don't know. Was it Google or IBM that most recent news? I don't even remember. Uh, I think it was. I think it was IBM that came out with. Uh, I was a 16 qubit processor, which doesn't sound like a lot, but in quantum it is. And when you gang those together, I, I don't know. <laughs> that that is a computing that that defies. I mean, you, you think, and we won't we won't stay on this track too long, but quantum computing. So it's based on a qubit, which in oh. the fundamental element is a one, a zero, or both. How does that work? <laughs> you know 70 72 qubits from uh google i'm gonna get over the link it's not a processor that's the machine right the whole machine uh it says it's the the chip i haven't actually read this one i just saw oh, the wow. headline i'm sorry holy macro uh yeah that's yeah. square root of qubits wow <laughs> so schrodinger's cat right Mm -hmm. You know the concept of Schrodinger's cat. That, that's like part of it. It's that's that's so nuts. Is the cat alive or dead? Or it could be either in the box. <laughs> it's either it's until, until you open it. <laughs> it's either until you open it. Right? Yeah. That's. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's it's fascinating stuff, but it's a little crazy. <laughs> it's a lot crazy. It is. I mean, it's just you know, it's a little freaky. It, it defies logic, but it's not. It's not cust. It's not traditional logic. It's quantum logic so yeah anyways let's move on to something a little bit more traditional and actually marco i'm gonna jump out of order because while okay. you're talking i gotta go i gotta go fetch i gotta go fetch a, a product to show the folks while you're talking about the intel hades canyon nut uh knock nut <laughs> <laughs> is it a walnut <laughs> hades oh. canyon knock oh, oh yeah hold back don't, a dirty joke <laughs> don't go there baby don't I go there did, yeah <laughs> <laughs> the next unit of computing is what NUC and UC stands for. We're never going to get another one for Ripper now. Yeah, I know. We're doomed. You mean this guy right here? This thing is so sexy. Tell us about that. What's special about it under the hood and all that? I'll be right back. Okay, so <laughs> I I really, really, really dig this machine. This is, so I'll, I'll get the model number out first. The code name is Hades Canyon. This is the NUC 8 i7HVK. This is the high-end Hades Canyon NUC. Now, there's a few reasons this machine is special. First is the form factor. This is a pretty capable 1080p gaming machine that fits in my hands right here. So for a, for a NUC machine, for something this small, you see a, a ton of I.O. on the front, a ton of I.O. on the back, including you know dual gigabit LANs, plenty of USB. This thing can do... Um, I believe it's six or four monitors, but either way, a ton of connectivity on this machine. But what makes it really special is this is the first NUC to feature a um, Core i7-8809G. That is one of the new KB Lake G processors with the Radeon RX Vega graphics core on the same package as the CPU. Um, the CPU and GPU are connected through an EMIB. Um, I'm forgetting what EMIB stands for, but basically... Multi-die energy connect. That's it. I don't have it in front of me. That's that's awesome stuff. <laughs> so you end up with, you know, this fast quad-core processor with Radeon Vega graphics in this super slim form factor. Now, this this brand type of chip will also be in, in notebooks, in, in Ultrabooks. It's in the XPS 15 2-in-1 that we recently reviewed. Now, looking through the numbers, here's what makes it special. Fastest NUC by far, but and it even competes with some full-size desktops in terms of CPU performance. Fastest NUC by far, like in a completely different class. If you look at, technically this is on processor graphics. So if you look at graphics performance, versus other on-processor graphics, it's just in a completely other league. You see little graphs in this big, long graph for Hades Canyon versus full-size desktop GPUs. Performance is about in line 
a little better than 1050 Ti, not quite as good as like an RX 470, but still in this low power, slim form factor. So super powerful, gorgeous, full featured NUC. Another cool feature, customizable lighting on here. So there's a skull on the top that lights up. You have control over the lighting on all of the LEDs, not just the skull on top. Um, the only drawback, well, two drawbacks. One is one of them is on the screen. The power brick, which is in that picture that is being shown, is almost the size of the computer itself. And oh, wow, is, yeah. Is pricing. So the bare bones unit is a grand for this high-end one. Throw in mm. memory and storage and an OS, a few hundred dollars more, there's clearly a price premium over building your own full-size desktop, but there is no way you could build anything this big, this fast, this cool. Um, it's just an, just a really awesome little machine. Oh, I mean, that's about John. the size of one of those, uh, the old CD players that we used to stick in our computers before USB drives took over everything. <laughs> So I almost <laughs> dated myself when writing the article. This is about the size of a VHS cassette case. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's not dating yourself that bad, though. I mean, I think... So, we, here, here, let, let, let's so, so here, here, here's the machine. Here's a Galaxy Note 8. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's, that's amazing. Hey, John, I, I tossed a link in the chat. If you can pull that up, it's a, it's a link to the chip, some coverage we have on the, on the actual chip. Eighth generation core processor with AMD Radeon RX Vega M graphics. I don't know if you can see that. Um, but <clears throat> that's what's remarkable about this thing is, is the processor on board, right? Um, it's remarkable in a number of ways. It offers that kind of performance. There it is right there. There's the chip itself. That is the um, KB Lake G, uh, uh, the code name KB Lake G. Uh, <clears throat> Intel processor on the right in that image, uh, GPU and associated HBM, eight, four gig of HBM2 memory on the left. <clears throat> and um, what's impressive is that it is a, a collaboration between Arch rivals, Intel and AMD. You know, it's like <clears throat> it offers some pretty breakout performance in that kind of form factor, but it's also indicative of a collab we never thought it's like hell froze over, right? <laughs> You know, when you when you step back and think about it, now now that we're further removed from the original announcement, it, this makes a ton of sense. NVIDIA yeah. is simply kicking ass, right? NVIDIA is just rocking lately. It can't yep. be touched in the high-end GPU space. Um, they're killing it in the data center. They're, they're, you know, all this stuff is further out because of just how, the, you know, product cycles work in automotive. But the self-driving car stuff, they're, they're, looks like they're killing it there. Nvidia is just is is rocking. They're a juggernaut right now. So, Intel needed or wanted killer graphics. So they turned to the enemy of Nvidia, who's also happens to be their enemy on some other fronts, but this deal now, every time Intel sells one of these one of these NUX, other machines, other notebooks that are going to have these Kiby Lake G chips in it, AMD makes going to make some money. AMD selling a graphics core now with that. That's that's great for AMD. Right. This huh? implementation in this first thing we looked at is great for Intel. Yeah. So it, it this is a cool part. And now step further back, I'm sure Intel can throw whatever GPU they want on there with that EMIP. It doesn't have to be Vega. If right. if, if they yeah. you know they Raja formerly of the you know Radeon Technology Group is at Intel now specifically said they're going to be working on discrete gpus it's entirely possible this is just laying the groundwork for you know an intel discrete gpu and then they can sort of have this one processor core and scale graphics up and down and just connect them through that emib so yeah this is a, a really cool development but for for right now it's good for both of them and it is a really cool implementation like i'm just i'm looking at the the fire strike benchmark just as a, a quick example a chart for fire strike it's the next closest integrated graphic solution the vega 11 in raven ridge is less it's like 40 percent as fast it's just it's not even close yeah it's awesome like this thing and and then if you look at power now so this machine is it's not super low power it comes with a 200 watt or maybe a 230 watt power supply i don't remember exactly but idles 14 watts 
when you're whacking the CPU, just like it would a regular single core workload, 39 watts. All cores in the CPU hit is only 81 watts for the whole system. And if you're gaming, hitting the CPU and GPU, 139 watts, right? That's less than just a single GPU in the desktop system. This is this is a really cool setup. Yeah, 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 cool stuff. Um, and and yet you, you make a good point that that interconnect is kind of well, one of the special sauces. If you if you think about the evolution of technology here, we've gone from a CPU and a socket. GPU and a PCI Express slot to everything on chip, like, you know, no joke, everything on a single chip that's this big, you know, that big in my hand, a couple of inches across, a couple inches high and or an inch high rather. And <clears throat> that that embedded multi die interconnect bridge, that's what EMIB stands for, um, is it, it allows these things to talk to these two CPU and GPU almost to talk on package you're not talking across a pcb and long traces now it's that close proximity wise so the latency is is super super low everything's just right there and so yeah. there's a certain without, amount of without the interposer you know without an interposer and right. in low and in low profile you know I, yeah. you know i didn't mention there's also hbm2 with that gpu on here it's got four gigs of dedicated hbm2 this is a really highly integrated, very cool chip that uh, Intel and AMD pulled off. Yeah, it, it's a, it's a it's it's sort of a, an engineering, you know, um, you know, prowess example for for Intel and probably AMD. But there's some serious package engine engineering going on there. Like, no joke to make that thing in volume and do what it, and do what they did with it. I mean, that's where the the mojo is. That thing is that thing's freaking cool. It's a cool chip. <laughs> you know, now that we've seen it, and yeah, like you say, now that we've got a chance to play with it, when we first heard it, we were like, "Why would they do that?" You know, uh, that was our reaction, right, Marco? But you know, because it just it seemed unnatural to our rivals working together. But no, not so yeah. much. <laughs> so we actually have a question about this in, in the chat. Um, Joe is asking. Yeah. Um, I see Apple KB Lake G. I think he's asking if we'll see a MacBook KB Lake G machine, um, given that Apple hasn't been using NVIDIA. I, I don't know. I would not be surprised if a version of this tech ended up in a MacBook because, you know, AMD yeah. is, is favorable to, I'm sorry, Apple is favorable to AMD graphics. Um, and for now, they are still using Intel processors. So we'll see. I, considering how long it took to update the MacBooks recently, I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon because the new ones yeah. kind of just came out. So. Right. Well, that said, yeah. Apple, oh, I was going to say, Go Apple ahead, has made a bit of a promise to uh, be better about their pro line as far as updating hardware goes. So hopefully that means that we'll see uh, quicker iterations on the hardware side. But it is Apple, so I'll believe it when I see it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. Hope nobody from Apple's watching. We're going to get some daggers. Yeah, no, and in, in actually Apple's working on their own uh, silicon these days pretty hard. So we'll have to see how that all pans out. Um, but yeah, what what's what's unique about this chip is the form factors it enables. And as Marco, you pointed out with that with that knock, it's just this tiny little thing. It Other applications, obviously, you could see um, all in ones being a natural fit for this, the all in one PC. So whether that be you know, um, something from Dell or HP or one of those guys or Apple in an iMac. Um, I have a machine that also employs the technology right here with me. And this is Dell's XPS 15 2-in-1. And uh, this is why I jumped around because I wanted to go fetch this little guy from, from the studio behind me. Uh, and uh, it is a 15-inch convertible uh, Ultrabook. I'm going to try and get it more in the frame. Okay, yeah, there we go. And as you can see, folds back into tablet mode. Okay, you're talking a little over four pounds. I think I wanna say it's like 4.2 pounds. Um, beautiful setup, right? Um, brushed aluminum lid, nice and thin and light. I mean, if you like a 15 inch form factor, this is about as thin and light as, as it gets without compromising structural integrity. And so you got machined aluminum, nice chamfered edges all around. And then, of course, the palm rest is built with Dell's hybrid fiber, uh, carbon fiber, excuse me, construction, which feels great and looks great uh, on the, uh, the palm rest area. So the XPS signature design that we all know and love, they have the, the new KB Lake G processor inside this now. So now you've got that NUC-like performance 
you know, that, that powerful mini desktop like performance in this laptop, four pound laptop. And they've also built some thermal solution in here, a dual heat pipe thermal solution that does a really good job of maintaining performance over time and managing the, the thermals of that chip on board this laptop. So it's actually the fastest 15 inch uh, machine we've tested to date with, um, I should say a 15 inch tune on a convertible that we've tested to date. Um, it's, it's really impressive. It's it basically GeForce, gtx 1050 ti performance and a four four pound and change two-in-one laptop the display is also awesome too they amped the uh the display up to a 400 nits um brightness uh this is the 4k it's igzo technology uh with 400 nits of brightness panel so it's it's beautiful it's a beautiful panel really can't say enough impressive machine the only thing that's a little bit of um, uh, of, a, of a hold back on this is battery life with the 4K panel because you're lighting up all those pixels plus that powerful chip. Um, it, it's not bad. I mean, you, you're sort of middling battery life versus other um, sort of 15 inch, you know, fuller featured machines. It's 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 you know right in the the middle of the pack. Um, but uh, I think the 1080p display would be a maybe a better option if you're concerned with battery life. But performance on the thing is just just crazy for for its form factor. What did you guys think about that thing? Uh, did you take a look at it, um, Marco? I know you've seen it, Chris. What do you think? I know you're an XPS line fan. Yeah, I th I, th I think that's the model that I saw when I was at PAX. Correct me if I'm wrong, um, or is at least very similar to that. And it was great to work with and uh, beautiful panel on it. That is the really hard decision. Do you go with the 1080p or go with the 4K? Everything practical says stick with 1080p because Windows scaling is still not fantastic. So you can get some apps that are just going to be microscopic on the screen. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the battery life is a huge consideration, especially when a lot of the purpose of an Ultrabook is to be an all day machine out on the go. Um, so that is a drawback, but it's so gorgeous that you can't help but want 4K to work. <laughs> yeah and actually uh joe joe asked in the chat let's go ahead and paste the link yes the re full review is up swing on by um and yeah it, it's uh he's asking 4k adobe colors yeah so the 4k panel supports 100 percent of the adobe rgb color gamut uh there's the specs and um the 1080p panel uh, supports 100 percent srgb um not uh not adobe rgb so which um to, and i'll interject that on the color space yeah. because there's a lot of confusion for people if you're doing photography you actually yeah. want to be working in the srgb color space because if you're doing any print or sending it to the web so many computers and devices still don't support full adobe color space um that you can end up with either the web interpreting your colors wrong or other issues. So when you're doing the photo editing or video editing, you really want to be in the right color space for what you're doing. Um, but uh, so sRGB is far from a bad thing. It, it is still the standard. Um, and it's just a matter of how rich your colors are going to be when you have that special Adobe RGB content. Right, right. Cool, cool stuff. And actually, um to talk about color space and lighting and, and image quality the cameras you're viewing us through by the way um <laughs> brought to you by logitech uh you're looking at looking at the podcast nice via plug. three right this is actually this is actually a sponsored plug they sort of sponsored the podcast sent over three cameras and said hey take a look at these and go ahead and cast away over them the um logitech um c922 pro stream webcam and uh it is designed for streaming and, and casting and uh yeah that's that's what we're doing on all of these so um good stuff from the folks cfps 1080p yes uh, all that all the piece yeah it's better with low light <laughs> than the 920 i was using so that's always handy don't you that don't was need to use quite as much light yeah, that was my observation was the lighting was was way better backlighting like you see in, here in my studio um, and in my office. Yeah, it's uh, a little bit better on that for sure. Marco, he looks good in any light, so bastard. Just look how pretty. <laughs> Just look at this. Look at this. This is unreal. 
Oh. A lifetime of hard work right there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a 10 miles of bad road, a lifetime of hard work. I don't know which. You know, no. the, the, the funny <laughs> part, in, in real life, <laughs> real life, I look like Gollum. This is yeah. totally camera this is all oh, the camera oh <laughs> right. it's camera magic yeah <laughs> it's all we're about here is smoke and mirrors you should know that yeah <laughs> oh goodness all right so yeah let, let's let's move along a little bit more on that note um and and i'll mention um something i've been taking a look at or i actually did a review on as well um uh not based on the uh kb lake g processor this is based on eighth gen uh, processor technology from Intel, just standard integrated Core i7 stuff. This is the um, Lenovo ThinkPad X1 Carbon, and it is, um, let me see if I can fire it up for you. It is, uh, hey, you can see backlit keyboard. It is new for 2018. This is the sixth gen version. This is your basic super light. This is a two and a half pound machine. It is not even three. There we go. I'll spin back here, get a little bit more. Yeah, there you go. Laptop on display. So, <clears throat> and and what's unique about this, I think, is one, one of the reasons why I, I use these machines, I use the ThinkPad X1 line, the, uh, the Carbon or the Yoga. Uh, this is the Carbon because I really like the keyboards. The keyboards are just super workhorse. Some of the best keyboards in the notebook business right here. And, um, but this machine amped up with uh, eighth gen core technology now. So that's a nice uh, upgrade. But the other thing they did, which sort of blew my mind because I didn't think anything could compete with OLED after being spoiled by OLED notebooks. I saw a couple of those, uh, Lenovo has one. Uh, and then uh, the Alienware line from Dell has mm -hmm. a 13 inch notebook. This has an HDR display. This is a 14 inch, 2560 by 1440. Keep shutting off on me. Um, 2560 by 1440 resolution HDR panel. Um, the technology is TPLS uh, something polystyrene. It's not. It's a different type of LCD. It is non-touch, and um, but it's 2560 by 1440 res. Yeah, LTPS, 500 nits of brightness, HDR. Uh, uh, capable. And <clears throat> it is actually impressive to see side by side versus OLED. Like if you're, if you're dead nuts right on, and if you hit the review, you can see I've got some AB shots versus Lenovo's ThinkPad X1 Yoga from last year that has an OLED display. I thought one of the best notebook displays in the business at the time, this thing actually competes. It's standard LCD. So you don't have that, the concern for OLED burn in with it. Um, side by side, it's almost OLED just has it by a hair with slightly deeper blacks. Um, when you get off on a viewing angle though, actually this display holds up a little bit better. It's a little bit brighter and it, and it holds the image a little bit better. You get a little bit more washout on the OLED panel, believe it or not. And so, yeah, there you go. There's a, there's a couple of images that show that AB, um, in the foreground and the background and, and the smaller, uh, X1 Carbon with HDR display is the machine you uh, to look at there. That's the smaller one that I have with me, the X1 Carbon. And so, yeah, impressive stuff. And when you when you fire up HDR content, and I hopped on YouTube and pulled up some HDR movie trailers, it makes a significant difference versus OLED. Like you see the range, especially in lighting, you know, big big range of uh, of lighting scenes where you've got dark areas, lots of color, bright areas. Um, you can see a difference, even on an OLED panel. You think OLED would hold up pretty well to HDR, and it does versus a standard panel, but not compared to this thing. It's actually kind of impressive how, uh, it, it, how, how it performs. The other thing that's coming online isn't available yet. <clears throat> it's HDR compliant, so HDR10, which is an open source HDR um, specification that folks follow, uh, from content creators to, you know, hardware folks. Um, Dolby vision is sort of a step up from that. And it, it will have Dolby vision capability later on this year. I want to say actually maybe later this month, uh, wasn't available for when I tested it. And Dolby vision gives you a little bit more information, uh, per scene, uh, on the color space. So it allows, um, better tuning per scene not just the entire movie uh of of hdr rendering so per scene hdr rendering versus the entire um film and 
that's supposedly I haven't seen the difference. It's going to increase fidelity when that capability is available. And a lot of producers, I'm told, movie producers, uh, content producers, work in both because it's a subset of HDR10 or a superset of HDR10, and it's not that hard to do to just render for both. So yeah, kind of cool. Uh, the ThinkPad X1 Carbon. Lenovo surprised us a little on the pricey side. Um, I'll have to look up what our configuration was. Um, I believe it starts at twelve ninety nine. Yeah, the configuration was about twenty five hundred. Uh, yeah, yeah. We we had a we had a terabyte it's, NVMe it's SSD in out. there. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it starts at starts at I'm sorry fifteen hundred dollars. So it's definitely a premium laptop. Starts at fifteen hundred. <clears throat> we tested twenty five hundred yeah, as tested. But um, with a with a one terabyte SSD, sixteen gig of RAM, and that HDR panel, I would say the panel go for it. And especially in a fourteen inch form factor, that fourteen forty P is kind of perfect. What do you think, Marco? Mm -hmm. Is this your kind of jam? That machine's awesome. I got to see it live at CES and experience that screen as well. Um, we all know Lenovo makes killer, killer notebooks, um, just good stuff all around. So couple the Lenovo build quality in that machine with that really cool screen. And uh, yeah, I'm all about that thing. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a, it's a good, good machine. We're, we're getting a lot of really good, like what's impressive now is that notebooks that are coming to market and we've got to start, you know, we got to look a little bit more at Acer. I've got some good stuff. HP, we're going to be looking at the Spectre X360, also with the KB Lake G. That's going to be coming in shortly as well. Really impressive the 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 horsepower you get in notebooks these days, and the and the build quality and the materials and workmanship. Certainly, the price has gone up, and you know we can all back down to 1080p displays, and you know maybe get a smaller SSD to to, to curb that price, but what's available the range of options and what you can do in a laptop these days versus you know even a couple of years ago is kind of blows my mind it's it's impressive stuff it's, it's fun for us guys right we got a lot of a lot of toys to yeah. play with in the test bench the, the lots premium of notebooks are definitely more premium these days than they've ever been and as much as i hate to admit it we probably have apple's trend setting to think for that with their <laughs> macbook pros um, but the PCs Come are definitely, on. they're definitely doing it better. Uh, Apple got the price up there. Now PCs are bringing the quality. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. You know, Apple, well, Apple brought the quality first and I mean, you have to hand it to them back in the day. Um, you know, they, they really sort of set the bar and now others in the PC world are, are setting the bar, not only from a, you know, a materials and workmanship standpoint, but from a usability and features and all that good stuff such that i mean frankly the apple stuff is kind of you know I, I don't know i'm i'm a i'm a windows guy so maybe i'm biased a little bit but i don't think there's anything apple has from a hardware standpoint that you know the pc the pc realm can't compete with on on almost every level os aside i mean if you're yeah if you're the, if you're a mac apple user ecosystem is yeah. very very nicely integrated i will give them that um right. i'm I, I just still can't wrap my head around the macbook that came out that was thinner than the macbook air and has like nothing inside from a systems board perspective or horsepower or anything else um and they were still charging over a grand for that <laughs> yeah no it's it's a it's a premium sell for sure with apple uh that is the way they go to market and they'll make no bones about it they're not looking yeah. to they're not looking to slog it out in the low margin uh set but um yeah you know uh, it, it'll be interesting to see i think you know one of the headlines we we talked about uh, and we'll and we'll sort of wrap up on this marco you've got something to tell us too as well on uh on things you're going to be giving away but um yeah a sign of the times for apple is they are now not only trying to compete <clears throat> for a high margin business but they're trying to compete to capture more margin on the cost side of things um apple claims uh report claims apple to ditch intel chips in max by 2020 intel shares tumbled but frankly the market cratered this week recovered a little bit thankfully. Um, but yeah, so now we're getting rumors of Intel 
uh, or excuse me, Apple, um, you know, designing, you know, designing processes to supplant their Intel partnership long term uh, to sort of bring that capability in house and and own that technology, obviously squeeze a few more dollars of profit out of it, too. Marco, do you think that'll ever come to pass? I know you've got some strong feelings on that. <laughs> I think in typical uh, analyst fashion, it's probably a misinterpretation of a rumor. I think it makes sense and it will probably happen that uh, Apple makes its own processor for a, a Mac MacBook Air, some sort of mobile MacBook type device along the lines of what we're seeing on the Windows side with the Qualcomm Snapdragon based machines. I do not see Apple completely revamping their OS and software, hoping all of the developers revamp all their OS and software and developing a chip powerful enough to say, go in a Mac Pro for some sort of professional content creation machine. I don't see that happening. So mm. what, what, what I think happened is there, there, there was a rumor out there, an analyst you know, had an inside source picked up on the rumor. Um, maybe is not quite as tech savvy as he should be and said they're just going <laughs> to ditch Intel when it's more likely that MacBooks or Macs, whatever type of Macintosh it is, some will be powered by an Apple chip. Some will be and, you know, sort of be akin to a big blown up iPad and, and where others, the powerful stuff will be still on maybe not an Intel CPU because, you know, Threadripper is pretty badass, but uh, some sort of powerful x86 chip could be completely wrong. Apple has blown up their uh, platform in the past and switched, but mm -hmm. I just don't see, I just don't see it happening for the content creation crowd, which is the area that in, Apple makes the most money on a Mac. I mean, let's, let's be honest. The Macintosh is the redheaded stepchild at Apple right now versus the iPhone. So I, I, I just, I don't know. I don't see them blowing it up and starting over. It's it's fascinating to, to think about. I, I think, you know, I, I recall back in the day when, um, you know, Apple converted from uh, IB, uh, excuse me, Motorola Power, Power PC. PC. Yeah, Power PC processors, which is risk based versus CISC. Uh, so risk processors, which is ARM technology, you know, ARM is risk architecture. Um, back in the day, they, and then they converted to x86. And that was huge. That's like, Man, yeah, you got source code. You're talking about, you know, coming from a Linux, you know, or Unix background with with Mac OS, and and that whole, you know, repository and years and years of source code on PowerPC to to, to switch over to, to Intel and x86. That was much, so they've made that they've shifted that gear in the past. I agree with you, Marco. I I, I think they didn't have the be, market share. Man, I don't think. Yeah. They don't yeah. have it now with the Mac either. I mean, no, but got, I think they've got a better foothold than they used to when they switched from PowerPC to Intel. Right. Right. Yeah. No, it, it's it's a fascinating dynamic. And man, I mean, technology, you know, we, we guys, we've been in this, we've been in this gig for a while now. And it's every year we seem to get a little bit surprised by stuff. But then you learn it's like, no, it's continual. It's relentless. It just doesn't stop. The change is coming every day, <laughs> and and yeah, from from Intel and AMD working with each other on a on a combined chip to uh, you know who knows Apple designing their own someday. I mean, let's face it, their silicon prowess in in, in handsets is is impressive. A eleven A eleven Bionic is no joke, right? I don't have any real concerns with their ability to produce chips that perform. What could be interesting is seeing the security side of things, as we see with Spectre and Meltdown, how since they would have a smaller market share of those chips specifically, um, how security would be addressed for those. There's something yeah, that, uh, yeah. dramatic came up, but looks like we're being a little push for time. So. Yeah, yeah, no, no problem. Yeah, let's uh, let's wrap it up, Marco, real quick. Um, let's talk about the uh, the Raven Ridge giveaway, the Raven Ridge AMD Corsair giveaway. You got something going on? You're gonna build it, right? We got it. We got all the stuff we announced last podcast. So up for grabs, super easy to win. AMD Ryzen 5 2400G in an ASRock AB350 gaming uh, K4 motherboard with a bunch of gorgeous and really nice 
Corsair peripherals and components thrown in. Uh, Corsair 750 watt PSU, a beautiful Corsair Crystal Series 570X chassis, 16 gigs of Corsair Vengeance RAM, um, a Corsair K70 rapid fire keyboard, and also an RGB mouse. Just really nice fun system that we're giving away all you have to do to win is come by the site participate in some conversations make some friends with some other geeks and that is it maybe like a couple facebook pages and you are entered there Instagram, you go twitter facebook <laughs> youtube all we're all, all our all the socials yeah yeah no that that's good stuff thanks mark yeah so the folks from corsair and the folks from amd we're giving it away we usually give away something big every month and this is the this is the one we're doing this week we decided to fire up some some amd raven ridge goodness uh inside some corsair skins love it so stop by hothardware.com where you can find us on the web twitter.com slash uh hot hardware facebook.com slash hot hardware youtube.com slash hot hardware or hot hardware vids hit the subscribe button and get notified when we stream and you can join us would love that would appreciate it and uh yeah man that's about it right guys that's it baby <laughs> that's it for for us geeks thanks for stopping by <laughs>